The Bears of Blue River, Chapter 8, The Black Gully. Note, the author, fearing that the account of fire springing from the earth, given in the following story, may be considered by the reader too improbable for any book, but one of Arabian fables, wishes to say that the fire and the explosion occurred in the place and manner described. The fire bear had never before been seen in the Blue River neighborhood. His former appearances had been at or near the mouth of Conn's Creek, where that stream flows into Flat Rock, five or six miles southeast of Balsa's home. Flat Rock River takes its name from the fact that it flows over layers of broad flat rocks. The soil in its vicinity is underlaid at a depth of a few feet by a formation of stratified limestone which crops out on the hillsides and precipices, and in many places forms deep canyon-like revises through which the river flows. In these cliffs and miniature canyons are many caves, and branching off from the river's course are many small side canyons or gullies, which at night are black and repellent, and in many instances are quite difficult to explore. One of these side canyons was so dark and forbidden that it was called by the settlers the Black Gully. The conformation of the rocks composing its precipitous sides was grotesque in the extreme, and the overhanging trees thickly covered with vines cast so deep a shadow upon the ravine that even at midday its dark recesses bore a cast of gloom like that of night untimely fallen. How Balser happened to visit the Black Gully and the circumstances under which he saw it, sufficiently terrible and awe-inspiring to cause the bravest man to tremble, I shall soon tell you. The country in the vicinity of Flat Rock was full of hiding places, and that was supposed to be the home of the fire bear. The morning after Polly and Balser had seen the fire bear, they went forth bright and early to follow the tracks of their fiery enemy and if possible to learn where he had gone after his unwelcome visit. They took up the spoor at the point where the bear had crossed the river the night before and easily followed his path three or four miles down the stream. There they found the place where he had crossed the river to the east bank. The tracks, which were plainly visible in the new fallen snow, there turned eastward toward his rep reputed home among the caves and gullies of Flat Rock and Conn's Creek. The trackers hurried forward so eagerly in their pursuit that they felt no fatigue. They found several deer, and at one time they saw at a great distance a bear. But they did not pursue either, for their minds were too full of the hope that they might discover the haunts of the monster upon whose death depended, as they believed, their lives and that of Lenny Fox. When Balser and Polly reached the stony ground of Flat Rock, the bear tracks began to grow indistinct, and soon they were lost entirely among the smooth rocks from which the snow had been blown away. The boys had, however, accomplished their purpose, for they were convinced that they had discovered the haunts of the bear. They carefully noticed the surrounding country and spoke to each other of the peculiar cliffs and trees in the neighborhood so that they might remember the place where they should return. Then they found a dry little cave wherein they kindled a fire and roasted a piece of venison which they had taken with them. When their roast was cooked, they ate their dinner of cold hoe cake and venison, and then sat by the fire for an hour to warm and rest before beginning their long, hard journey home through the snow. Polly smoked his after-dinner pipe. The pipe was a hollow corn cob with the tip of a buck's horn for a stem and the two bear hunters talked over the events of the day and discussed the coming campaign against the fire bear. I suppose we'll have to hunt him by night, said Polly. He's never seen it at any other time, they said. Yes, we'll have to hunt him by night, said Balser, but the darkness will help us in the hunt, for we can see him better at night than at any other time, and he can't see us as well as he could in the daylight. Balser, you surprise me, answered Polly. Have you hunted bears all this time and don't know that a bear can see as well after night as in the daytime? Better, maybe? 
Maybe that's so, responded Balser. I know that cats and owls can see better by night, but I didn't know about bears. How do you know it's true? How do I know? Why, didn't that there bear make a beeline for this place last night, and wasn't last night as dark as the inside of a whale? And don't they go about at night more than in the daytime? Tell me that. When do they steal sheep and shoats? In daytime? Tell me that. Ain't it always at night? Did you ever hear of a bear stealing a shoat in the daytime? No, sirree. But they can see the littlest shoat that ever grunted on the darkest night. See him and snatch him out of the pen and get away with him quicker than you or I could. A darn sight. I never tried, did you, Polly? asked Balser. Polly wasn't above suspicion among those who knew him, and Balser's question slightly disconcerted him. Well, uh, I darned if that ain't the worst fool question I ever hear the boy ask, answered Polly. Then, somewhat anxious to change the conversation, he continued. What night do you propose to come down here? Tomorrow night? No, not for a week. Not till seven nights after tonight, answered Balser, mindful of the charm which he hoped like Lenny's prayers would make for him. Seven nights? Jiminy, I'm afraid I'll get scared of this place by that time. I'll bet this is an awful place at night. Nothing but great chunks of blackness in these here gullies so thick you could cut it with a knife. I'm not afraid now because I'm desperate. I'm so afraid of dying because I saw the fire bear that I don't seem to be afraid of nothing else. Polly was right. There is nothing like a counterfeer to keep a coward's courage up. After they were warm and had rested, Balser and Polly went out of the cave and took another survey of the surrounding country from the top of the hill. They started homeward and reached the cozy cabin on Blue River soon after sunset, tired, hungry, and cold. A good warm supper soon revived them, and as it had been agreed that Polly should remain at Mr. Brent's until after the fire bear hunt, they went to bed in the loft and slept soundly until morning. After Balser announced his determination to hunt the fire bear, many persons asked him when he intended to undertake the perilous task. But the invariable answer he gave was that he would begin after the seventh night from the one upon which the fire bear had visited Blue River. Why after the seventh night was frequently asked, but the boy would give no other answer. Balser had invited Tim Fox to go with him, Tom Fox to go with him, and Tom, in addition to his redoubtable hatchet, intended to carry his father's gun. Polly would take Mr. Brent's rifle, and of course Balser would carry the greatest of all armaments, his smooth-bore carbine. Great were the preparations made in selecting bullets and in drying powder. Knives and hatchets were sharpened until they were almost as keen as a razor. Many of the men and boys of the neighborhood volunteered to accompany Balser, but he would take with him no one but Tom and Polly. Too many hunters spoil the chase, said Balser, borrowing his thought from the cook's and the broth maxim.